But I'm excited to be joined by a very special guest. Somehow, Ryan Fowler, first time guest of this this program. Although, gosh, I've been on with you on the game in Tuscaloosa more times than I can count. Um, but it's good that we can finally make this a home and home. How's everything going? Hey, absolutely, man. Thank you so much for allowing me. And I do want to thank you for all those radio appearances throughout. I mean, it's people like you that come on and, you know, do great interviews. And, you know, anytime I can come on and help uh, you guys at Saturday on South for a couple of minutes, kind of repay that favor. I'm a big fan of uh, uh, the guy that owns y'all's company. I know uh, John real well and uh, always a big shout out to uh, to Coop. And I uh, always appreciate you guys for having me on. It's good to, good to talk a little college football with you. Yeah, glad glad to have you, man. It's uh, it's something I should have done a, a long, long time ago. And, you know, it's it's interesting from your vantage point right now. And probably, like, honestly, one of the reasons that we're, we're just doing this now is because I think Alabama is more interesting than it's been in a very long time. And when you go through a coaching change, obviously, it was always going to be interesting. But the changes that we're already seeing. How has spring been with actual access to the program? Like, do, do you want to, like, just come on these airwaves and release all of Alabama's deepest, darkest secrets now that you've had access to, like, practices and talking to actual coaches? You know, it, it, it has been a little it, – It's it's been overwhelming, to be honest with you. It's it, like when you go to practice and they go, okay, well, here's every assistant coach and here's five other players – and it's like a, you know, it's kind of an all-you-can-eat buffet with content, right? I mean, it, it's like for four hours I do every day. I, I talk nothing, but well, we, we do, you know, Nate Oates is uh, because the excitement around the Alabama basketball is is really, you know, kind of picked up a lot. But uh, mainly, you know, we're a college football show, and the amount of content now I'm having to filter out. How what do I use? How do I use it? What way do I use it? Uh, it's it, and I almost feel guilty too. I mean, so so Connor, you, you're going to be a little therapist here for a minute because I feel like every time I say something, I say something negative about Coach Saban, right? I feel okay, like if I brag on Kalen DeBoer in in return, am I saying something negative about Nick Saban? There's just two different ways to do it, right? Nick Saban's way worked. I mean, for 17 years. He won six national titles, what, nine SEC titles, all those, you know, success stories. There's nothing wrong with the way that he, he did it. And it never, you know, even though I didn't have a relationship with Coach Saban, um, you know, I couldn't call him up, you know, as the afternoon drive host and say, Coach, can you jump on for a couple of minutes? I'd love to get you on. You know, I think there's some great topics of conversation, even paying tribute to him. Um, I tried to get him a couple of years ago for like an April 27th, 10th anniversary, because he played a very important role when the tornado hurt, uh, hit here in Tuscaloosa. I, I couldn't couldn't even pitch that. It was, you know, it was a shutdown pretty quickly uh, there. So I, I love what Coach Saban was able to do in Tuscaloosa. I'll be forever grateful for the job uh, that, that he gave me because the amount of interest picked up. When Alabama started winning, I was able to do a, a local show here in Tuscaloosa because even prior to his rival, I was doing something part-time but I went full time with Coach Saban, so I'll be forever grateful. But it has been a a breath of fresh air, and I think even inside that building, they're feeling it as well. Because when you walk in that building, there's a tone there and a vibe that has just it's been missing. It was there in a the lot of the the Saban dynasty, but the last few years, it, it almost it, it felt it just unique. You'd walk in, and it was just it was like everybody was walking on eggshells, um, and and you know, they took a, uh, you know, a three-year break of not winning a national title. So maybe that was part of it, uh, that they had not won one since 2020. And maybe that was some of it, but, you know, the pressure was on to go back and try to win another one because, you know, we know the, the perfectionist that Coach Saban is. Uh, but it has been fun, you know, with K1 DeBoer. We've already featured him a couple of times. And uh, I think just keep it a tally, he, he spent 21 minutes with me. Uh, the first time he spent 1958 with me, uh, so almost 20 minutes uh, the second time, and then uh, in 17 years I got three minutes and 40 seconds with Coach Saban. So, uh, Kalen DeBoer is in the clubhouse right now with an easy lead after 74 days. It's amazing when you put the numbers to it like that. And for those who are listening to this, saying, "Well, I, I don't care," my 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 mood or feeling about the program isn't associated with media access. I totally understand that. And it's something that we like to talk about, but 
I do think that there is something to be said for the tone that you're setting within the building and what it means, why you want media access and why you don't want media access. To me, that's more of the important thing. And it's, you know, an interesting topic with somebody that's coming in who's going to do things differently than Nick Saban. That was always going to be the case, no matter if it was a Saban disciple or a non-Saban disciple. And Kalen DeBoer is very much a non-Saban disciple. Um, a lot's happened in the last two months besides just being able to, to talk to him and feel like the program is a little bit more accessible. But with the transfer portal window, the staff that he hired, the recruits that he signed, let's let's start instead with the negative because you said you said a lot of positive things about him already. What do you think so far, based on the job that he has done, is fair to say is his biggest Achilles heel to this point? Wow. Connor, this might be a show topic. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I have an answer. And I'm not just saying this. Um, That's fair. Because when I look at it, okay, and I, I wrote this on a on a tweet on Sunday. I think it was, it could have been Saturday night. I just put together some random thoughts. Maybe it, it was Sunday. And I said, uh, you know, when you look at recruiting, he's ahead of expectations. Uh, because there's a lot of people that said that he would not be able to recruit the Southern kid. Hey, this guy's the Pacific Northwest. He's from South Dakota. He spent a little time. He's not going to be able to connect. That, that doesn't seem like that that's a problem. They also said that he would not be able to hire coaches. And, and Connor, this is probably going to be your soundbite uh, that, that you're going to put on the headline of this podcast. I think his coaching staff is going to be better top to bottom, 1 through 11. Head coach at number one, 10 assistant coaches. Nick Saban was top heavy, right? You had Nick Saban, and then you dropped off fairly quick. Um, yeah, you had some quality coaches there. I'm not discounting them. But I think when you look at this coaching staff, it's better than what Coach Saban had, probably for the last couple of years. Uh, and I think that's really one of the things that Coach Saban identified through Chris Lowe, that it, it, it had become a challenge to hire coaches because he could no longer promise them. I mean, look at Tommy Reese for just a couple of minutes. I mean, I almost feel sorry for him, right? He leaves his alma mater. He comes to Tuscaloosa. And in one year, he's he's out of, you know, this job. And he's coaching tight ends for the Cleveland Browns, which is good for him. But it, it, it's almost like he left his alma mater to come to Tuscaloosa for one year. And now he's out. So you, you kind of understand why these coaches were not going to go, okay, no, we all know Coach Saban is, you know, at some point, Father Time's going to catch you. So just, just going back to your question about Kaylin DeVore, recruiting coaches, recruiting, talking to these players, they have – and Kaylin corrected me last week. I said, it seems like the players have bought in to what you're, you're talking about. He said, let's just use the word buying in. That They're buying in. It's a process. It's not, you know, that they have bought in as past tense. It's something that they're currently doing. So I think when you, when you listen to him talk, the media access – yeah, I mean, let's get to the you know the real bullets get to flying with you know real live action. We do have a scrimmage you know for the next couple of weeks, and then the final one being a day. And I'm sure, we'll have a lot of things to talk about there. But at this point, I, I don't know because the transfer portal, the national narrative was okay. Well, he lost a lot of guys in the transfer portal. Well, to be fair, a lot of those transfer portal guys were going to be there prior to Nick Saban. If Nick Saban would have stayed in Tuscaloosa. I think there was probably one kid uh, that could have pushed maybe Nick Saban over the top, uh, you know, demanding more money and just decided to, you know, all these things kind of added up and kind of confirmed to Nick Saban, hey, it's time to get out. It's time to get out. So when when you think about it, like I, I can't really criticize because I think they've had this hire in the back of their mind for some time. Uh, now, I've got a hypothesis, it, It's and I could probably – create some type of alternate hypothesis too. But I think really, if you go back to interviewing Ron Grubb last year, Nick Saban interviewed Ron Grubb and they spent a significant amount of time here. He was his number one choice. I think they were also exploring who Kalen DeBoer was. I think they were already hmm. kind of starting to go, hold on a minute, let's find, because Coach Saban admitted via ESPN that he said, we're, we're going to have to start evaluating this on a year to year basis. He told he told Greg Byrne that that we're going to have to start evaluating on a year to year basis. So then when you look through Kalen the board, I'm not saying there was anything shady going on, but things get out in the coaching fraternity. 
He hired Jimmy Sexton last summer. So he went with a different agent, which has a working relationship with a lot of schools in the Southeastern Conference down here, the bigger schools. Then when you go to the contract that was presented in early fall, he said he was going to talk about after football season. Then he was presented a new contract, a, a, an enhanced contract in December, part of the college football playoffs. And then all of a sudden, he finishes up on a Monday evening. He gets back to Seattle. You know, in my hypothesis, I don't have anything to base this on. That's probably when they said, okay, would you have an interest in Alabama? Then it was Nick Saban. Because I don't think Nick Saban would have left the program in bad terms. Let's say that they could not have got a quality coach. I think he would have came back for another year and said, okay, hey, I understand that you know, the coaching cycle has already went through for 2023. So I just – I look at it and I think, man, they've been evaluating Kalen DeBoer uh, for a little bit of time. I think they've spotted him from way back when. So when I look at it, the criticism, I, I can't come up with anything. And I, I know that's probably going to sound like a homer. Uh, you know, ask me September the 28th when he loses to Georgia. We could talk about then. Uh, but, but right now at this point, I can't imagine off to a smoother start in the transition of the last 76 days. I remember doing a radio show in Portland. I think it was early in December and I go on with them like two or three times a year. And that was a very popular topic of conversation of this DeBoer contract and why hasn't it been, been figured out yet? And, you know, do you think he could leave? And they were starting to, to kind of read the tea leaves then. And it's interesting when you kind of put those things together and you could say, well, you know, why, like, well, he still wasn't their first choice. Like Sark was was definitely their first choice. Kiffin, you know, like say what you will about Greg Byrne not wanting someone like Kiffin. But the point is that you've kind of already vetted those other people and those other people like a Dan Lanning or something like that. So your relationship with them is a little bit different than with DeBoer. And that's probably going to be something that Alabama fans look at. Like they're going to do their own vetting of, of him and they want to see when the bullets start flying, what this all looks like. One of the things that could determine how the tone of this year one goes is obviously that relationship that he has with Jalen Milrow. I'm fascinated to see how this plays out with Milrow, with his skill set, with the things that he still has to get better at, and with things that we've seen him already do. What do you think that relationship? Oh, we got, we got, is that, is that DeBoer calling you up right now? DeBoer is saying, no, like, that, hey, Ryan, no, we got to do an no, interview no, right no. now. <laughs> no, no, no. That That's the auto warranty. Listen, I'll know that I'm dead when I don't get that call every day. Every day I get an auto warranty call. Okay. Every day I get that, the, the call. So I hope it didn't interrupt uh, on the, uh, the Apple there. So, uh, so I'm also fascinated with this too, because, okay. If in, I went to grad school uh, here at the university of Alabama and many times what they would do is they would say, defend the other side. Okay. Take it and defend the other argument. Okay. If you think, you know, and, and I was in human anatomy physiology. So if you believe that something is, you know, real about blood pressure, hypertension, or uh, whatever you're studying, then go and defend the other side because it makes the, this case stronger. So if you said, Ryan, defend why Jayla Milrow is going to be successful in this system, then I could do that. I believe I could also flip it around and say why I question if he's going to be successful. So I could probably defend both arguments. And I'm I'm kind of like what you said. I'm intrigued to see how far Kalen DeBoer can get Jalen Milrow because we talked about recruiting a couple of minutes ago. Think about if he's able to take, let's say Jalen Milrow, let's just paint a, a wild uh, season. Let's say that he wins the Heisman Trophy. Let's say that he puts this team on his back and they go win a championship, an SEC title, a national title. Let's say that Milrow goes out and maybe he's a first-round quarterback because if, if the passing attack can get there with his mobility, the NFL loves that. And especially as this system is now you know transitioning that for the quarterbacks the last, what, seven, eight, nine years. So if you think about that, what if it all comes together? What if it all comes together for Jalen Milrow? He, it just clicks. Also, keep in mind now, he's a grad student. Many times we see these quarterbacks take that big step as a grad student because of time flexibility and, you know, you have like one Thursday night class. It's not walk into class for a 50 minute class. Then, you know, all this downtime grad school is a little bit different. Plus there's a lot of great independent study classes that you can take and, you know, you, you have even more time. So what if he's able to do that? What is that going to tell that quarterback recruit out there? Look, you know, I'm struggling here. I need to get here. 
Well, look at what Kalen DeBoer did. You know, I kind of look back at, at Jalen Hurts looking at Lincoln Riley. Mm-hmm. Look at Lincoln Riley. I mean, people try to pretend that Jalen Hurts is the same quarterback now in the NFL. He struggled here in Tuscaloosa, grasping the offense. Lincoln Riley, the quarterback whisperer, was able to take him to places that I think a lot of people, probably including myself, didn't think that that he could get there as a player. So what if Kalen DeBoer is able to take Jalen Milrod? He works with those short, intermediate passes, and they're able to really, you know, I know we talked about it a couple of days ago with CBS Sports Radio talking about, hey, you know, the mobility is going to scare a lot of defenses. It's nightmares for defensive coordinators. And I think all that stuff is true. So if he's able to do it, now what if there's another quarterback that comes in and beats him out? What if it's the, you know, maybe Dylan Lonergan or Ty Simpson or maybe Austin Mack who just transferred from UW? Um, then then there's a story there. Maybe that he didn't grasp the offense that they were trying to get. Because, but the way that I answer this quarterback question with with people calling into my show, that you should be worried about other things other than just the quarterback. I know it's a fun conversation. I like to have the conversation with the quarterback. Whoever Kalen DeBoer rolls out there in 150-something days, you're pretty comfortable with where they're going to get as far as quarterback production. So whoever it's going to be, you almost feel comfortable that that quarterback is going to play at a better quarterback play than Alabama got in 2023. What are your impressions of Nick Sheridan so far as the the new OC, somebody that's had a, a weird career trajectory, but – by all accounts, quarterbacks really seem to like him and gravitate to him. But obviously, when you're the offensive play caller at Alabama, you're held to a different kind of scrutiny than any job you've had before. Well, and, and I think it's, you know, I think Kalen is capable of calling all those plays. It's his offense. He's called it for, you know, what, the last 14, 15 years. I mean, it's it's his offense. So he's always, you know, there if, if he's needed in that role. But I think Nick Sheridan's a guy that they were grooming. Let's say Ron Grubb would have, took the job at Alabama last year. Let's say he would have, you know, been Nick Saban's final OC, then I think Nick Sheridan would have probably been that guy. And I think that's what Kalen likes to do is he attaches these co-offensive coordinator or co-defensive coordinator. And what he tries to do is he grooms that next group of coaches. Like let's say Nick Sheridan gets a job offer, you know, in 2025 for, you know, somewhere bigger, you know, whatever the job may be, maybe it's a head coach or a smaller school then they're already grooming Jamarcus Shepard for that responsibility. So it's kind of the way they do things in, in this K-1 divorce system. So when you look at Nick Sheridan, everything that I – we've met him twice, uh, highly impressive. And I think the, the players connect with him too. I, I think they they see that connection that, that he's been forming. And, and keep in mind, I mean, they did it in a short amount of time. Uh, this If there's one thing this coaching staff can do – is build relationships, not with just the current players. Uh, and, and it'll be very important as we enter this transfer portal window that will open up in April uh, that those relationships, I mean, they hit the ground running, but just the connections that I've heard from players behind the scenes, they also really like Nick Sheridan and the creativity that he's going to bring. But I also think that they're going to work to the skill set of Jalen Miller. I mean, Kaywin said it on my show two weeks ago. Uh, he said it on multiple other interviews. Hey, we're we're going to take the strengths of our player, and I think it's what good OCs do is they take their players and adjust the personnel. I think Lane Kiffin's one of the best uh, at, at taking players and saying, "Okay, what can you do? All right, we're going to maximize your strengths and we're going to disguise your weaknesses." And I don't expect any different from K. One of Boer. I don't think they're going to try and turn him into Michael Penix Jr. I just don't like. I, I, I agree. There's more flexibility in this offense, and I, I do think that there is going to be a, a a give and take. And, you know, Tommy Reese had the same sort of deal with Jalen Milrow and figuring out what type of quarterback that he was. Um, I think the questions are more on the defensive side moving forward. And I've had to explain to a lot of people why Kane Womack is not just this out of nowhere D.C. hire who, like, he's going to have to establish all these, you know, recruiting ties in the state it's like he's got those like that's actually the part that i'm like not worried about and you can kind of see a little bit of that playing out of like how respected he is and you know the the recruiting has gotten so much more transactional with nil and as long as that's aligned and those relationships are there like i'm not worried that he's not sitting here signing blue chip talent at, at south alabama the question i have is more so what does it look like when he has that game where alabama allows 35 40 points because 
Saban gets away with that because it, it's Saban and we know that the net result is, is still obviously there. But what does it look like if Georgia scores 42 points? All of a sudden it's like, man, this guy just, just isn't getting it. He's not protected in the same way that a Pete Golding was or something like that. Where do you think this Alabama offense is going to go in this this first year without kind of Saban as the, the CEO of this defense? I think they're gonna. Have, I think the offense is gonna have to carry this team. I, I'm I'm right there with you. There, there's just too many pieces uh, that you lose over there. You've got some guys that can be a big time playmaker. Uh, you know, when you consider things around Deontay Lawson, uh, Jahad Campbell's. I think is gonna have another. I mean, he just looks the part that he's really you know busted his butt in the fourth quarter program to get things ready. So I think when you look at this defense, but it's the secondary. Th- that's the question. Now the good thing is, is is when you look at uh, Kalen's offense is going to stress this defensive backs. They're going to have to grow up quickly, right? Because they're going to get challenged Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, but that's the that's the area of concern. Yeah, you've got some guys that can really, you know, step into big roles uh, in that secondary. But I still have some questions back there. And it's just youth. It's it's you know whether it's Mika Fitzpatrick starting as a true freshman in 2015, or whether it's Caleb Downs. You're going to have growing pains, and you're going to give up touchdowns, and you're going to give up scores. Um, this offense, if you tell me this offense is a is a B minus or a that, that's why I think it's so important to get it right over there. You, you just don't have the margin of error on the defensive side of the football. So the offense, but but to go back to Kane, I had Kane on my show. Um, I guess it's two two and a half weeks ago, and it was a ton of fun to be able to kind of pick his brain about. He understands that the standard around here is defensive play, right? Smash mouth football, uh, play great elite defense, and I think they're gonna they're gonna be devoted to to building, you know, that type of you know championship caliber defense. I just don't know if it's gonna be in year number one. I, I just think there's defensive line looks pretty solid, linebackers look pretty solid. It's just the secondary where, where I see some issues, and you lose, you know, Terry and Arnold and Kool Aid McKinstry. I, I get it. You got Jackson coming in. Uh, that should help you on the corner side of things. But you're probably going to go to the transfer portal. I, I think you, you'll see them go out and get a couple of corners uh, to maybe. And really, that's the other part. If Let's say if they can get some guys that can be plug and play, then I guess that changes all that. But I, I really like and, – and I did hear that Kane had had a conversation. I asked him about this. He didn't elaborate too much. But he did have a couple of meetings with Coach Saban. And he kind of explained the defense, the four two five. And when he did, uh, I think Nick Saban, according to people that I spoke to, was pretty impressed with what they were trying to do with this four two five defense. So there are some similarities. And I asked Kalen about this last Wednesday of what would what would the casual fan be able to see different in a four two five? And he said, going to be a lot of similarities, even though they're labeled a little different, uh, the the verbiage around it. It's going to be very, very similar. But uh, as you know, we'll find out. Uh, hopefully he'll release some stats following this first scrimmage, and we'll go, oh, wow, that defense is really struggling. But – or maybe the offense is not where they need to be. Yeah, the counterpoint is, all right, well, if, if the secondary is getting torched and they're they're just getting their, their lunch served to them every day, that's probably a sign that Alabama's receivers are taking that next step and the system is working out really well. So you can kind of look at it from whatever vantage point, glass half full, glass half empty, you kind of want. Let's do a little multiple choice here for you because the Bama receivers, it's going to be a pressing issue until we actually see some of these guys emerge. Who is the leading receiver for Bama in 2024? Is it A, Kobe Prentice? Is it B, Ryan Williams, the five-star true freshman? Is it C, Jeremy Bernard, who comes in from Washington, already with the knowledge in the system, member of the Albany the Drum Team? Is it Kendrick Law? Or is it E, and maybe the most intriguing option, a post-spring portal guy? Wow. You know, do they go, you know, because of – and we'll wait on confirmation from Jalen Hale uh, as far as, you know, how much time he's going to miss because I, w- I was told that he was having a great spring, uh, and, and, and that was unfortunate – uh, there, but we'll, we'll wait on official confirmation of maybe they they've got the severity there. I, I'll go with Jeremy. J- just just when I think about it, I, I just think the system that he understands is there. But from a highlight reel, Ryan Williams is going to be uh, because I asked both 
Kalen, the first time I had him on, I said, because this was after National Signing Day, so he could talk about Ryan Williams. And so he shared some thoughts about Ryan Williams that I'm talking about literally. I mean, if you're going to write a resume, put that quote in there. It was just, you know, he's as far ahead of any player I've ever seen at his age. That That is, that's a big comment. Then we had Jamarcus Shepard on like two weeks after that. And I asked him about Ryan Williams because, you know, he was a big part of recruiting him and getting him back into, you know, the commitment side for Alabama. And see, that's another part right there is Ryan Williams believes in this K1 DeBoer offense. I mean, let that kind of sink in. Whatever he was sold, he says, hey, I can be a part of this. I can be a part of, you know, what's happening, you know, in Tuscaloosa and have a, you know, very impactful role. Um, I still, I'm going to go with a veteran and I'm just going to go with Jeremy. I, I just think that it, it seems like it, the system is there, the terminology is there. But also, I think K-Law is going to have another, Kendrick Law, I, I think he's going to be another guy. Because if you look at him from a physical standpoint, he looks like a linebacker. I mean, he, he is he is chiseled. Uh, I mean, he could probably play, you know, an emergency situation, maybe on the defensive side of the football. He looks like one of those physical guys uh, in this system. But it all depends on those short intermediate passes. Are, are those going to be a part of the offense as they were up in Washington? Because Penix threw 263 passes, zero to five yards. That's interesting. Alabama last year, uh, and this is PFF stats, I want to give those guys credit there, but uh, 113. Alabama had 113. So it was, I mean, it was 40%. So short intermediate passes, if they're able to get that, there's a lot of those guys uh, that can really, really step up. But I, I'm going to go with a veteran. I'm going to go with a veteran. But a highlight reel, Ryan Williams. I think this guy can do some special things with the football. But leading receiver, I'll go with a veteran. When I close my eyes and think of an intermediate pass at Alabama at attempts last year, it was the Milrow flick. That it was like that that little like like almost like a shovel pass thing that he would do, yeah. and that's that yeah. was always my sign when he was really dialed in from that standpoint. And it always happened in the midst of his best games. It's almost like you talk about in baseball, like in baseball when you're a hitter, it's like when you're driving the ball back right up the middle, and it's just line drive at the pitcher. Like that's when you're super dialed in. If you're pulling everything, like that's when you're you know you got to be able to make that mental tweak. But when when Milrow was able to do that, that told me so much that he was seeing the field and he was understanding what the offense was doing. He wasn't sensing pressure too much and that everything was kind of working. Those guys that can get open when things break down like that and get that separation, it's going to be pivotal because that's still going to have to be a part of this offense. I don't think it's going to be all entirely scheme that's going to work in favor. You'd like it to be more, but I, I think that that progression can can still be there. And I would love to see what it looks like with guys that that you're seeing develop and you're seeing take that next step. They just haven't had that. Washington had that. Washington was able to get that. Will they get that this year? It's it's a fascinating question because I, I think that's going to determine so much about whether or not Bama fans are sold on the DeBoer offense after this year. Yeah, when, and if all that comes together, the deep ball was there last year. And I know they threw more deep balls up in UW than Alabama did. Uh, but the deep ball for, for Milrow was his strongest uh, throw. If that short intermediate stuff gets there, combined with the mobility, if he's willing to to take off and run, New York City, uh, here they go. Uh, because I mean, I, I think I mean it could. I mean, I think it could really be that type of season. I mean, if everything comes together, uh, I think Jalen Milrow could be in New York City, you know, representing as a Heisman finalist and, and may win the whole darn thing. Another guy that I'm I'm really interested in in how this this plays out. Really, the next not just next couple of months, but the next year for Ty Simpson. I have sold a little bit of Ty Simpson stock. I can admit that because at this time last year I was going on places like the game in Tuscaloosa and saying I think Ty Simpson's going to be the starter, not Jalen Milrow. But here we stand a year later, and he's got a new coaching staff that he's got to impress. And it's not a guarantee that he's going to be QB two. Do you think that he stays for another year? knowing that they just brought Austin Mack with them from Washington, who was their quarterback of the future there? Or do you think maybe he does like, you know, a post-spring transfer? Like, how, how do you see all of this 
this playing out and what is what is his 2024 look like? You know, Ty believes that he's got a role, right? I mean, he stayed here. Um, that to me was probably maybe one of the biggest stories there of just saying, okay, you know what? I believe I have a role. Now you could also take it and say, well, he believes he can challenge Jalen Milrow at that starting quarterback job, but you could also, maybe he sees the transformation that Jalen has taken and says, he's going to be a one year and done, right? He, he's going to be gone, right? So maybe I can be there. I can be there for this system. I could be there, you know, when Milrow, exits that, that this will be my team. I'll learn this Kalen DeBoer offense. Um, it's hard to transfer to a program that, you know, and I had a someone who had called in and said, well, you know, where would Ty Simpson go? It, it's it's hard to go win a job in, in college football post-spring at that quarterback spot. Th- that's the part. So if, if he transferred, would it be an advantage to him not just to stay here because of, you know, the, the Kalen DeBoer, you know, quarterback whisper that he is. Maybe he can get him to places that Ty. But I, I saw Ty take a lot of steps uh, as, as a quarterback. I mean, you know, everybody remembers the South Florida game. It was not where, you know, he wanted to be, um, not where that team wanted to be. But look at where Ty Simpson ended up. I thought really as a player, he got better. Let's say if he could take that next step, hey, you know, I'm sure Austin Mack transferred here for a reason. But I, listen, Ty Simpson can spend the football. I mean, he's he's a guy that when you go out to practice, you can see that the talent level is there. So I'm not giving up on Ty Simpson. I, I just I, I look at him and I say, okay, uh, let's see what he's going to battle because you know if if he can find a way to you know connect some of those dots and and I think really skill set wise, you know, he's an elite quarterback. Um, I think he's got to grasp the locker room more. I think that's where Milrow. He has the skill set, but he get those players to follow in him. You know, that Nick Saban always used to tell us the team picks the quarterback. The team picks the quarterback. Well, in fairness, um, I think Milrow is an easy guy to pick, right? He's an easy guy to get behind because you can see those leadership characteristics. I think Ty needs to take more of an active role in that. If he's going to, you know, be QB, you know, QB two, or if he's going to compete for QB one, uh, take some of that leadership responsibility. I think he's done that. But I think he needs to do more of it. Yeah, you see it with Milrow. It's it's evident. I mean, like how much yeah. Milrow loves Bama. Like in this day and age of transfer portal NIL stuff, I like I I know it's kind of cheesy and like you know there's the stuff where every post game interview it's roll tide and he's and he's smiling, he's running off. Like if I'm a Bama fan, I love that stuff. If I'm a Bama player, I'm like that. That's the best. That's that's what I want my quarterback doing just banging the drum every single time for, for my program. And, and like, it's hard to get that when you're, when you're a backup, obviously. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see kind of the way that this pecking order plays out and selfishly, I want to see him get reps. I want to see him play elsewhere, but the idea of him like running the DeBoer offense one day is super intriguing as well. And just depends on kind of the timeline and how things line up and how he's able to develop Uh, last question and last prediction for you. Give me a year one outlook for for DeBoer. Uh, regular season record, uh, yar non SEC championship berth, yar non playoff berth, like wherever you want to go. How do you see this playing out in 2024? Well, there's part of me that would like to see him go win a national title just to see the meltdown of the rest of the SEC. Um, because I'm already seeing some anxiety. Them dogs over in Athens, they're not barking a little bit. I mean, every time I put up something positive about Alabama, they come behind it, you know, to say, you know, Nick Saban's gone or, you know, so, so there you can see some anxiety is brewing uh, over in over in Athens. Uh, Auburn, I mean, I expect probably another six win season. That's been pretty consistent. I mean, they, at least they, you know, for the last four or five years. So uh, they might have a little anxiety, but it's just typical anxiety for the Tigers. But I, I think when you look at win total, I, I would say, I, I would go over the the Vegas at nine and a half feels like free money over. Uh, you look at the trip to Oklahoma. You look at the Georgia trip here. You you back up a couple of minutes and you kind of begin to kind of think about you know SEC title. Let's say if he wins an SEC title, how big of a step that would be in in year number one to make it to the playoffs. I I think this team is going to be better than a lot of people. I think a lot of people read the national narrative. Hey, the cupboard's bare. Nick Saban left it in this. He, these guys hit the transfer portal. When I go out to practice, I'm going, 
guys, this is a very talented football team. You, you could sit there and you can go, especially, you know, with Caden Proctor coming back at that left tackle spot, that solidifies really a lot of that offensive line. you got to find a right tackle, but now you have three guys competing for one spot rather than, you know, two guys over here and two guys over here. So the offensive line should be good. Running backs, Justice Haynes is going to be an absolute monster uh, in, in the SEC. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to feel good about Alabama. Um, I, I'm not going to say they're going to win a national title. I just think they're going to be better than expected. Because I see this, like, if you look at national championship odds, they're like fifth or sixth. I, I think they're going to be right there in the thick of things. And how much that would create uh, what you and I do as far as conversations that, you know, Alabama just didn't die when Nick Saban retired, that Kalen DeBoer is going to come in. And could they be better, Connor? What what if they were better than, than what they've been in the last couple of years? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's one of those things that, like, you try and think about – a year one coach and the expectation of what, what, what could play out? Like what's the most likely path for, for a specific team. And you could point to a Miami with Larry Coker where he takes over in year one, boom, sure. your, your national championship and wow. Ohio state. I think that 2019 team with Justin Fields, it gets lost in the shuffle, how good they were and how raw a deal they got in that game against Clemson on that, you know, interception re- or uh, that, that fumble return that gets called back. But like, there are so few examples of a year one coach stepping in and doing those things. And I think, you know, and Gus Malzahn, but that, that comes out of nowhere, obviously it's not with the championship, you know, standard and, and, and all the things that are associated with it at Bama. So yeah, look, it, it's going to be a, an overly dissected year one for Kalen DeBoer, but, but an exciting one. And one that I'm sure for, for people like yourself that look, you cover the same thing over and over with Saban and as great as it is, and as much as you can acknowledge that the success has been there, it's changed your life. I talked about, about that with Jim Dunaway all the time. It's like my, my life has been changed because of Nick Saban being as good as he was. Absolutely. You probably feel like there's a nice breath of fresh air right now. I think you described it. And Jim's Jim nailed it again as Jim is a veteran. Uh, we love Nick Saban, but there's two different ways to, to skin a cat, right? And K1 DeBoer has got his way. Uh, it is a little refreshing uh, to to see how the real world lives, right? Uh, you know, I talked to people and they were saying, you, mean, you don't call up Coach Saban and ask him? Are you kidding? I mean, no way. I mean, not not a chance. I mean, w- there is no small talk with Coach Saban. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's just different. It's um, it, it's fun to cover. It's fun to cover. I'm excited of, of where this is going to go. But like I said, I'll go out on a limb and just say that, you know, that they'll win. 12, 13 games. I, I just I think this team's going to be right there in the thick of things. And Ron Day, uh, you know, the expectation of you to win a national title, uh, who knows? Maybe Kalen uh, slips in. And, you know, you got to remember, he's probably got some motivated uh, or extra motivation for losing that championship game last year. So, sure. uh, and some of those UW players that have transferred in. So, uh, you know, it, it'll be a It'll be a ton of fun, but I think they'll be better than expectations. They'll be better than what people think they were going to be. If that defense is able to click and Jalen Milrow is able to click, who knows? They may be hoisting up a national championship trophy that Nick Saban couldn't win uh, this past year. Ryan, great stuff. I'm sure we'll uh, we'll do it again in the next couple of weeks on your airways, man. Hey, I love it, man. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you guys so much. It's an honor to be on with you. Thank you, Connor.